Hey guys, welcome to Fringe FM Tech Talks. I'm your host, Matt Ward. I'm a serial entrepreneur, startup advisor, futurist, author, and somebody who's focused on trying to build a bigger, better world. This is part of our Fringe FM series, if you haven't checked this out, fringe.fm. It's like TED, but long form, so we can get the world's most interesting folks and talk about the things that really matter, and then so much more. I recommend checking it out. It's fringe.fm. And this is our first of our Tech Talk series. We're re-recording these because it turns out the microphone makes a big deal. We got a new mic, a Blue Yeti one, and would love to hear what you guys think about this, if the audio quality is better, and if you listen to the podcast. If you do and you're interested in learning more about the future, hit the subscribe button. But what we're here to do today is talk about e-commerce. Before we talk about e-commerce, though, I want to talk about what I'm excited about because, you know what, we need something to kick it off with. And I'm excited about, to be honest, this new microphone and the, the concept of e-commerce. So I realized from listening to a couple of our old recordings that our audio was going a bit to a bit to shit. So you know what? It's time to get a new one. I go on Amazon. I look up what the best is. I do a couple of review searches. And you know what? Click. I got it here three days later. E-commerce is transforming the world and getting us things faster and easier than ever. That's especially interesting when it improves quality and makes it more interesting for you guys. But you know what? That's enough. That's enough of that. Let's jump into e-commerce. So today I wanted to talk about e-commerce, and e-commerce is my bread and butter. For those of you guys who aren't familiar, I built and sold a couple businesses in the past. They've been primarily e-commerce businesses focused on crowdfunding, Amazon e-commerce, and white label or private label products. So I scaled, uh, I scaled a couple of businesses in the past and brought them, brought them to exits, and e-commerce is my specialty and what I, what I like to focus on, or what not necessarily like to focus on, but what I'm good at. So I wanted to have a brief overview of what is e-commerce. E-commerce is essentially replacing retail commerce. We used to go to the store to buy things. That's not really necessary anymore. Now we're buying more and more of our stuff online. I want to say Amazon and e-commerce made up around 5 to 10% of overall total commerce in the U.S. last year. And while that is a pretty small percentage, it's growing pretty rapidly and becoming a major player in the, the economic and uh, political realms, so to speak. Amazon is a government hall of its own at this point. But when it comes to e-commerce, there's two ways that things go. There's the platform play and the standalone play. Which is the future? That's the question. So all of us have bought stuff on Amazon. Amazon is the platform that's dominating the world. They did something like $140 billion in sales last year, just on the e-commerce side of things, which is pretty that's pretty fucking r ridiculous. We don't have to keep this chat censored. And if, if you feel the need to have something censored, I apologize for that. And feel free to blurt this out. But in, in the world of exponential epicness, sometimes you got to drop an F-bomb. And Amazon is absolutely that F-bomb that's transforming the way that we buy things online. So there's Amazon and then there's the, the Shopify or standalone approach. So as an e-commerce seller, I was built on both. We would sell on Amazon, we would sell on Shopify. But because Amazon's a platform and aggregates the demand, it was so much easier to get so much more sales volume. And that's the big direction that we see now in terms of e-commerce is fewer and fewer successful sites online and more and more of commerce being funneled through this one medium but between Amazon consolidating demand through their platform and then having Alexa and other stuff, which we'll talk about a little bit later, the platform model has become really, really strong. Companies like Walmart try to imitate this, but the only real competitor or real comparable would actually be Taobao, which is even larger than Amazon. This is Alibaba's e-commerce shopping site in, in China, which is absolutely ridiculous. Everything is miles ahead in China, especially when it comes to e-commerce. We'll talk a little bit more about the standalone nature and the, the business models of the future, but I want to talk about where e-commerce is at today. So there's a few different models. There's you sell something online, maybe you sell a subscription online. So you've got those hairy razor. Yeah, if you guys are looking, I, I need to shave a little bit, but that's what happens when you're running a business and trying to change the world. You don't have time. Turns out VCs like that. And if you're a little too focused, they might be more likely to fund you, but a subscription box model. So you get something delivered day after day, month after month, etc. when you need it. DTC or direct to consumer, that would be like a Casper type model where I need a mattress and you know what? God, I don't want to go shopping for it. And wow, it turns out there's a ton of middlemen in between here, which makes it ridiculously expensive, ridiculously uncomfortable. And I go to the shopping room store and they're just trying to sell me the most expensive mattress because that's how they get their commissions. Direct to consumer models can work really, really well in those type of situations where there is a really large inefficiency between the market and what's existing. The subscription box model, I'm not a big fan of personally. I think that, I mean, if you're going to sell subscription socks, if you're going to sell subscription 
pretty much anything that's not consumable. Eventually, I just have too many pairs of shoes. I have too many pairs of pants. I might not even be wearing pants. But the, the point is, when you're selling something like that, it's the reason that we've seen a lot of these subscription box companies, they kind of peak and then struggle a bit because once you get the people who are likely to buy into that, for instance, like Blue Apron, I'm, I'm in San Francisco, I've got the money, I'm kind of lazy, I don't want to cook, you can get those for a decent cost of acquisition, but then as you start to grow and scale the business, the economics just completely fall apart because you've already gotten the easy customers and only the hard ones are left, so suddenly your business model doesn't make as much sense, which is why Blue Apron stock has kind of gone down like skiing through the Swiss Alps since they've gone public. That's, um, that's subscription box and a little bit of direct-to-consumer as well because most business is direct-to-consumer. Although in a direct-to-consumer type model, like one that I really like actually, a company I've invested in, Public Goods. It's a bit like a Costco, a luxury Costco online. So you can buy the world's best stuff, luxury, organic, farm to table, all the good stuff that you would buy but everything's three bucks. You have a, you have a sh Costco type subscription where you're paying a subscription fee for it, which is how they make a bit of their money. And then make a bit, a little bit more as well because they source and manufacture all the products. So that would also be a direct to consumer type model that I'm really big fan of. Alternatively, there's white labeling. So that's what I was doing with my personal company and the uh, companies, I guess, in the past. These were focused on outdoor goods, um, home, gardening, sports, etc. But what we would do is we would find factories in China and manufacture products. And in general, I mean, a product is a product. It doesn't really matter what the brand is. So you know what? Rather than this brand, we can put our own brand on here. This is why if you see a Nike t-shirt, Nike shoes, Adidas shoes, they're basically exactly the same thing, but just have different brands on them. This is called white labeling. The problem with white labeling is while it's incredibly effective for driving prices down, there's no differentiation. So as a business model for the future, it's not one that's going to be very viable for businesses. Great for consumers, it brings the price down, but it's not something that businesses can make a lot of money on because there is no differentiation. There's no competitive moat, so to speak. And the, the last big model that I've seen as e-commerce that I think is god awful is, is shipping as a service. So when it comes to shipping, shipping always goes to zero. When it, it comes to speed, cost, and effectiveness of getting from A to B, whether it's Uber or Instacart or any of these companies, I want it done cheap and fast. I don't care about anything else. I could not care less who's shipping it to me. I just want to get it, like this awesome microphone, which we got, and it took two days from Amazon because Amazon has a logistics empire throughout the world. But if you try to build a shipping company, we've seen this happen a lot with delivery, both for food services like Uber Eats and for other just regular, um, like, buy stuff online or grocery stuff, it's it's just gone down, down, down. Now it works for Uber because they already have scale and they're already making money via different means with their drivers and their riders. But in terms of traditional companies or dealing with that as the e-commerce type model, it's not something that's really doing all that well. So as e-commerce grows, the, I want to jump into the next section now, which is the implications. Here's the obvious one. Physical retail is going to continue to devolve and suffer. It'll survive, but it's going to keep suffering because when's the last time you went to the store to buy something? Now here's the next question. When is the last time you went to the store to buy something specific? If you're buying something specific, there's no way in hell you're going to the store. If you've got babies like us, there's no way you're buying diapers. You're getting everything that you can shipped to you because it makes your life so much easier. So retail retail's definitely going down. But there's, there's a flip side, there's positives to these negatives as well, because as this goes down, suddenly there's less costs associated with retail space, etc. So costs go down. Also, as white labeling becomes more, more uh, ubiquitous, more consistent across the economy, products suddenly don't have as much value. If you can buy an iPhone, but it just doesn't have the iPhone brand, it's 500 bucks cheaper, why not? And that's what we call Huawei. And as you see, these are bringing prices down to consumers, but also democratizing access to good stuff. Not only that, you don't have to live in a major retail hub. You don't have to be in New York, San Francisco, etc., to have access to the latest and greatest products and services. You get those shipped from wherever the heck you are, via any merchant, via Amazon, etc., and the price of all that shipping is going down because shipping is becoming so much more ubiquitous. Everything is going everywhere. That's why, like, half the UPS trucks you see, they're just dropping off Amazon stuff. It and Donald Trump doesn't like that, but we don't need to talk about politics right now. So it, 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 e-commerce is really making things democratized and fairer for the rest of the world. Because these people have greater access to these products, there's a lot more choices. The, the paradox, though, is when you're buying things online, 
While you may have more choice, think about Google. You only see the first three results because you never go further. So while you have more choice, the winners actually become exponentially more to those higher ranking um, niche products. The 80-20 results become even more 80-20. If you're not familiar with 80-20, just Google Pareto principle. Essentially 20% of the products make 80% of the profit. 20% of the brands, 80% of the profit. 20% of the salesmen, 80% of the profit, etc, etc, etc. Well, that gets even more extreme when you have uh, an e-commerce world where there is a long tail, but there's so much more volume in that short tail from the, from the search volume and the search numbers. So, something that not a lot of people have considered, but the, the U.S. government specifically, this is U.S. specific, but sales tax, online sales tax, hasn't really been a thing. It's been kind of optional, semi-legal, semi-not legal to avoid it. And this has been very, very common with most sellers, and especially most Chinese sellers. Well, suddenly, as the, the sales tax laws are starting to get rolled out and Amazon's starting to enforce this, you're going to start paying, what, 7 8 9% more on anything you buy online. It's already miserable. If you buy stuff in Europe, you have to pay VAT, value-added tax. Well, in the U.S., things are going to be getting a bit more expensive from that as well. It'll be interesting to see how that plays out and how if Amazon or other type of retailers have a, have a better advantage. And the last implication that I think is really interesting is reduced brand loyalty. Do you really care what brand made, I don't know, your shirts, your shorts, your table socks, your, your diapers, your, your toilet paper? If it's good, it has nice reviews, and it's a, it's a product that delivers, then who cares? Do you want to pay more money for a, for a fancy brand? I certainly don't. And I think the vast majority of, especially up and coming consumers, they, they care a lot less about brand because they know brand is just marketing trying, designed to sell you something that you probably don't need. So as that starts to go away, the, the price of product starts to go down and access becomes even more valuable, uh, even more simple for people. People are able to access things they weren't previously able to access. Let's jump to the next section now, the pros of the e-commerce revolution. So a big thing that I'm excited about, and I'm not sure if you guys are or not, but is e-commerce in augmented or virtual reality. So there's two, there's kind of two different ways this plays out. One of this is like you're walking around and you got your phone and you want to check out this couch that's on Ikea or on Amazon. You want to see how it looks in your apartment. That's awesome. So interior decorators, yay. We love that. You want to try on some clothes, you step in front of a mirror, and suddenly I have something that doesn't look like a hobo shirt on. Oh, that's incredible. I'm going to buy that. Click. And because it's one click, it's even faster. I didn't have to go to the store. Yes, I'm still in my PJs and I bought a suit. That definitely has some big, big potential for e-commerce as we start to have more of a, a more consistent AR experience. Right now, using it through the phone, it's not that spectacular. We have some pretty interesting AR stuff coming out, but the, the glasses, etc., are too expensive. As those prices come down, we'll start to see more and more of that. And then even then, let's say I want to wear some enhancements. Not necessarily I want to buy a suit, but I want to buy like a physical suit so I can show up somewhere. And anyone who's wearing AR goggles sees like, wow, he's wearing a really cool pink tie that makes him look like a baller. Well, you know what? It's actually just projected there. It's not real. The people will start to sell things like that. It creates opportunities for creators. It also creates opportunities for businesses. The flip side of that, the really interesting part is VR. As if we start to live in more of a, a virtual reality where we have different worlds, well, I want to have a nice house, I want to be driving the Tesla, I want to have all of this excitement and all of this brand sexiness, because I I mean, when it comes down to, to brands and the things people buy, they just want to show off and feel cooler than other people, and they want other people to recognize that. That's the most important part. Other people have to recognize it, otherwise it doesn't count. Well, in VR, it's probably going to be very similar. E-commerce is going to be very interesting in terms of the things you can buy, the services you can buy. I, I talk about this a little bit more in the in my VR video, which will you can see if you check out our channel and hit subscribe. You'll see tech talks in VR. But uh, I think porn and prostitution will definitely drive the the VR e-commerce landscape. Technically, that's what happens is uh, adult entertainment typically drives technological adoption because they have to try things out ahead of everyone else. And you know what? If you need a business model or you need a market, etc., you need someone to create a platform for making money, well, the first people that are going to try that out are the ones that have kind of been screwed by the visa industry and the, the payments industry in the real world, plus the people that are willing to spend money, well... You can look at Maslow's hierarchy of needs. It's pretty, it's pretty prominent on there. The next thing, the next big pro is obviously the reduced cost for consumers, fair access to all. And then that also ties into the, the shipping and logistics as we have better and better supply chains. Ideally, we can start to optimize those supply chains a bit better because there is so much waste going on right now with e-commerce and things being shipped between different locations and having so much pollution just from that, that the shipping costs. I mean, it, it's horrible. If you go to, if you go to the grocery store and pick up 
I don't know, 100 things per week versus ordering things on Amazon and having like seven different shipments sent to your house. We need to get better about optimizing that. And whoever's able to do that either for Amazon or for other companies is going to be pretty successful in this market, hopefully, because it should help with reducing pollution, and increasing access. A couple of major cons that I see with e-commerce is, okay, if Amazon owns the whole market, let's talk about monopolies for a sec. What happens? Well, in a monopoly, typically Amazon's driving prices down. But as they drive prices down, all of the other businesses get pushed up. It's like they're doing a stiff arm and everybody else is dying. Well, as that happens, selection starts to decrease because you can't really make money very effectively. Your, your profit is, um, your margin is my opportunity. That's Bezos saying, right? Well, as that happens, Amazon's able to own a larger and larger chunk of the e-commerce segment, not just from the products that they sell for other people, but Amazon Basics, which if you've ever noticed, there's more and more Amazon Basics products coming up. As someone who used to sell on Amazon, this is a big freaking worrisome thing. Basically, Amazon sees what sells well on Amazon. They rip off anyone who's selling on there. They copy paste the product. They sell it for a little bit cheaper and they put themselves at number one. And that's how Amazon basics works. And that's why a larger and larger portion of the stuff you're buying is just from Amazon. So they're making even more money on that. Well, if I'm Amazon and I'm thinking, hmm, how do I make the most money? I get rid of everyone else. I just own the platform. I sell you everything you need to know. And eventually I become that by and large company and up that's kind of ruined the world, but owns everything. And that's sort of what Bezos is building. And he's pretty well along on this path. And most people don't seem to realize or care. Some other cons with Amazon is you just buy too much shit you don't need. If it's a one click button, suddenly you find yourself hmm, did I really need that? But I don't feel like sending it back. And even if I do, there's extra pollution. So you know what? I might as well keep it. So people are buying more than they would necessarily need because it's just way too easy. Then Amazon's controlling what you're buying. So if you're in a search volume, let's say um, let's say you feel like search results are, are tweaked, which uh, to, to be fair, they are as an Amazon seller. We were hacking anything that we could do to get a competitive advantage, including all of the things you've heard about reviews, etc. That was rampant across the Amazon, it still is, in terms of manipulating things to get more sales. Well, Amazon's showing you what's ranking well, but they're really just doing that because when you buy something, that means they make money. And the only thing they care about is making money and keeping you happy so you come back. They don't care about their sellers, which is why they're doing all this Amazon basic stuff and doing anything they can to increase fees and make more money there. But they also don't really care about you that much as well as long as you pay them. So. Amazon, eventually, when they own the market, why not just start increasing the prices? You've got a monopoly. Well, unless whoever's president is able to stop you, then by all means, just start to increase the prices, right? And once you own the economy, the, you have a much larger wild card to play than even a president of a country. So we see that now with governments, senators, etc., lobbying Amazon. Hey, come bring your warehouse here. We know it'll make jobs and this will make us look good and hopefully we'll get reelected so then we can get extra corruption money. But it's, uh, yeah, it's a kind of a self-fulfilling prophecy once you get big enough. A couple of big predictions I have for e-commerce in general. I see automatic buying of the basics becoming pretty damn standard across the world. Do you want to go and buy toilet paper? Do you want to go and buy milk, peanut butter, eggs, bread, etc. from the grocery store? No, you don't. If you order something and you eat this day after day, week after week, well, just start shipping that to me, Amazon. Thank you, Bezos. I love that. Well, that simplifies that, it simplifies it for toilet paper. Maybe I wear the same underwear. I wear the same socks. You know what? Uh, these seem to wear out like every year. Or maybe Amazon will suggest, hey, it looks like these wear out every year. Well, you know what? Eventually, you're just going to start having subscriptions of things coming to you, which is both good and bad. It takes you out of the need to think about these things, which allows you to focus on bigger picture ideas, at least ideally, and it just makes your life easier. The other way that this ties in is via voice. So with Alexa, with Google Home, etc., especially Alexa. Well, if you have if you have Bezos sitting in there listening to you and you say, oh, I, I would like to make some, um, let's make some chicken casserole tonight. Oh, by the way, did you know that we have all the ingredients for chicken casserole right here on Amazon? And we have Amazon Basics versions, which means this is cheaper than you'll be able to buy at your local grocery store. Do you want to buy them? Yes. Well, eventually, as you start to get into a more, a more expansive network of e-commerce, especially when it comes to retail and, um, and grocery. So Amazon bought Whole Foods, the one of the largest grocery chains in the, in the U.S., and they're starting to systematically eat groceries. People don't really think about it too much, but what would be like the best thing in the world? What if you had Pinterest for foods and it's like, yes, that looks good. Yes, that looks good. Paleo, keto, tasty, dessert. I like it. I like it. I like it. I like it. You click all these things, you add them to your wall, etc., and then Amazon says, add to cart. 
ding, 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 all these get shipped to your house. You don't ever have to think about meal planning anymore. You want it automated, you want it simplified, you want it however you want it, Amazon can do it for you. You're running out of something in your pantry, Alexa can say, hey, do you need more milk? By the way, it looks like you do. Yes, yes, yes. Well, eventually Amazon just ships you the Amazon stuff because why in God's name would they ship you someone else's stuff if they're making it themselves? So they ship you everything that you buy, everything that you eat, everything that you wear, or a very large percentage of that. Eventually, you got those handcuffs on and we'll see what happens there. But that's gonna, in my opinion, lead to the death or consolidation of most convenience grocery and retail chains. Because you know what? They just cannot compete with the data. They cannot compete with the customer acquisition and they can't compete with this epic marketplace. So to be able to combat that or in terms of where we kind of head with e-commerce, one thing we're seeing now more and more is experiential commerce. So for instance, a grocery store wants to sell, sell things. Well, you know what? Maybe they should open up a, a little part of their restaurant or a little part of their store where they do just demos. They start teaching parents, adults, young kids, etc., how to cook. You come in, here's these recipes that we're learning, and by the way, here's an add to cart button, or here's the ingredients right here so you can bring these home and make them just for you. Grocery stores should start having subscription type features for them because you know what, Amazon's gonna do it, so the only way the grocery stores stand a chance is to get there first. So experiential shopping is going to be really, really interesting. The same thing, you see a lot of these retail stores now opening that are kind of like test stores. You'll go in and they won't necessarily have products. They might have like one Fitbit. They might have like a shirt. They might have like a mirror where you can see yourself wearing different things. Well, you know what? You go in there, you try it out, and then Amazon or whoever it is, Warby Parker, etc., will ship you what you want. And it's a, it's a tryout store. It's a, If you ever walk through the grocery store and they have those nice little samplers, it's just like that. And that's gonna be kind of the direction that I see e-commerce going. And then the last big prediction is, when was the last time that you needed something? Now, when was the last time you got something you didn't realize you needed? I think we're going in that direction. And Amazon's already working on this. They're going to start, at, at foreseeable future, starting to send you a box of assorted things. Hey, we thought you might like these. Anything you don't like, just send it back. You know what that is? That's a subscription box where they own your world and where you probably like it too because their AI and their machine learning is so good that Amazon knows you better than you know yourself. So this is kind of the direction that we're headed and it allows them to own the buying and selling experience without anyone else getting in the way. Bezos doesn't want anyone else in the way and you know what, this is the ideal situation. Just send them things before they even know they need it and shit yes, now I have those biking pants. Now it's time to start biking because I was looking up this article online about doing a triathlon and I didn't have any bike pants and Amazon knows that. And that's the direction where we are headed with e-commerce. If this has been fun, if this has been exciting or helpful for you guys, be sure to hit the subscribe button right there. That'll make sure that you get notifications whenever we go live, which is every Wednesday at 12.30 p.m. Or whenever we're doing anything else that's interesting, you'll also be able to see podcasts, etc., and have a, have a lot of fun with following up on the future trends of technology and innovation. If you go to fringe.fm, you can subscribe for our newsletter. You can check out the podcast there where, as I said, we interview the world's top folks, leading sci-fi authors, leading AI, geneticist researchers, space, um, God, we've had some incredible space tech startups, quantum computing, you name it. So fringe.fm, go there, subscribe to the podcast, check us out, and make sure you subscribe here on YouTube. Thanks for tuning in, and hopefully this has been fun. I am Matt Ward, signing off. Cheers.